church has been silent while the world raised its voice. In loud and angry tones they took the lead. But all across creation there's a rumbling in the hills as the chosen ones of God stand up to make his message known. I'm gonna shout, shout it from the housetops, proclaim it from the mountaintops, tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice, I'm gonna make a joyful noise, the world will hear my voice Jesus saves. The rocks and hills were ready to proclaim the Savior's might. But the Spirit of the Lord said they should wait. You see, God knew His children were ready to march on and proclaim His word throughout the land and seal the devil's fate. But the world still tells us daily that God is not alive and salvation's plan is just a fairy tale. But their lies don't change the truth. Jesus died for you. And the word says his returning could happen any day. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops, proclaim it from the mountaintops, tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice, I'm gonna make a joyful noise, the world will hear my voice Jesus saves. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops, proclaim it from the mountaintops, tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice, I'm gonna make a joyful noise, the world will hear my voice Jesus saves. The world will hear my voice Jesus saves. Well, certainly our joy and our privilege this morning to have the founding pastor of our church, Pleasantville Baptist Church, 39 years later, uh, Pastor Terry Stewick, as if you were in the Sunday school hour, told us how God laid the burden on his heart to uh, start a church where there was no church. And uh, that's, that's what churches do. That's what churches are supposed to do. And uh, start uh, and um, be fruitful and multiply, I guess, is, is what churches are supposed to do. And I... We're, we're actually, our church is going to have an opportunity to do that here at the beginning of the year, which I'll share with you a little later, um, get a church started. And, um, but that's not what we're here to do right now. Right now we're here to uh, have Pastor Stewart come and uh, preach um, what God has laid on his heart. And uh, he's been someone that has, uh, for the, over the last 39 years, has stayed in ministry and in different aspects of ministry and has raised a family and, and now um, lives down in Atlanta, Georgia and uh, has come. I thought he, I asked him how the flight was this morning. He said, flight? I drove. I said, wow, I didn't know you're driving in. I, I, that's the young generation. We fly everywhere. I, if, it's, if I have to drive more than 10 hours, I try to fly. And that's just how, how it goes for me. But so you got on your horse and rode, didn't you? Brought in the, brought in the F-150 all the way from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and, and uh, got to tour the countryside. But um, we're excited to have him here. Come on up, and uh, we'll... Um, hear what the Lord um, has uh, for us this morning through Brother Barry, Barry Stewick. Thank you, Brother. Wow. I am so impressed with your song service and your service so far. I thought I did. Is it on? All right. I just need to talk into it. it is it nice to be forgiving of older people? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell that God's hand has been on this church. The church rises and falls on leadership. And you obviously have a great pastor right now and have been provided good pastors on through the time. Thank God for that. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to Matthew. <laughs> I think it's so amazed that I wrote a book. <laughs> a farm boy. Um, 
that I became so knowledgeable, or at least an expert in one area, expert, they say, well, you wrote the book on it. <laughs> that I could write a book on one subject. I think that's amazing. And I'm so humbled by the results of the book. As it was being passed around uh, between publishers and so forth, somebody said, well, um, you're not the only book on forgiveness. And I said, thank God. Thank God. If I was the only voice on forgiveness, God's in trouble. Because forgiveness is the bottom line to Christianity. As I ask people, and I witness to people daily, I ask them, give me one word, one word, summarize Christianity for me. And they'll go, it sparks a conversation. I can get a conversation going about God or Jesus, just, it's so simple for me. They'll come back with, well, love. Uh, um, uh, they come back with all kinds of things, faith, um, grace, I hear those words, and hardly any. Once in a while, I'll get the word forgive. Not very often. But when I give them that the bottom line to Christianity is the word forgive, they all shake their hand. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, I can understand that. Because that's what we expect from Jesus, isn't it? You expect anything else from him? Forgiveness is what we're after. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And we must read verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Awesome. There are people who would like to cut verse 15 out of their Bible. Wow. If you forgive not, God won't forgive you. Can I get your attention this morning with that verse? Let that verse impact you. Of all the things we've got to do as Christians, I think half the time we're training our people to live in the wilderness. I mentioned that this morning in Sunday school in Deuteronomy. The journey we make from the promised land or towards the promised land, the children of Israel left Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, sort of a picture of, of uh, the baptism, so to speak. And they got to the wilderness, Mount Seir, they, they received the Ten Commandments, and there was an 11-day journey to the Promised Land. And they could have been in the Promised Land in just 11 days, but because of lack of faith, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And oftentimes we spend our time as Christians in the wilderness because we fail to believe God. I think Jesus has a priority. Now this may sound odd to you, but I think Jesus is explaining here and expounding. He often does that. By the way, the Lord's Prayer, we didn't read all the Lord's Prayer. I didn't want to distract your mind off of anything but the topic of forgiveness. As Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, and this is the Sermon on the Mountain, he stops at the end of that prayer to give you verse 14 and 15. He runs his own commentary. He has just taught the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, and gives us this prayer, and then he stops at the end of it and pulls out the most important thing in that prayer to call attention to, and he gives you verse 14 and 15. Because if you'll forgive others, I'll forgive you. And if you forgive not others, I will not forgive you. Is there anything else in the word of God that he says he will not forgive? We 
would you say that forgiveness may be the top priority for Jesus concerning us? <laughs> My mind races on 40 years of experience. I remember uh, a, a pastor in Atlanta. Uh, my wife and I were headed back to New Mexico, and we heard this last message at our church we were attending in the Atlanta area before we headed back to uh, New Mexico. And uh, he, he said, boy, if your pastor gets up and, and says this, you want to get out of this church. And it was one of those sentences where I know the, word of, I know the will of God for you. <laughs> you know, nobody knows God's will for you, right? <laughs> We know more than got back to uh, New Mexico and uh, get the Bible classes, everything going, and, and we slip into uh, town for, uh, town, we live a long ways from town. And lo and behold, from the pulpit that Sunday, the pastor gets up and says, I know the will of God for you. <laughs> but there's one thing this morning I believe I can tell you about the will of God for you. God wants you to be forgiving. Wouldn't you say that's true? I can't tell you where to buy or sell your house or where to move or where, you know, that's not for me. But I can tell you what God is looking for in your heart. He's looking for forgiveness. There isn't anything else that he, that he puts that condition on. I think he's explaining his own uh, unfor unpardonable sin. I, I don't know whether you link it or not. It doesn't matter. But he's saying he won't forgive. Now, there are people who want to cut that out of the Bible. They say, well, no, no, there's, there's just too much. Uh, God wants us to love. Well, how do you love as much as Jesus? You can't. Jesus already said you can't. He said, greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And you might do that. You might give your life for your child. You might stand in the way of a train. You might risk your life to pull someone out. Uh, but how many of you will volunteer to go to Texas and take the place of the next man on death row who's slated to die for killing someone, your enemy? That's what Jesus did. He died for his enemy. We don't do that, do we? There's a limit. I, I can't think of any time in the... Why do I mention Texas? Well, they have a four-lane highway to the death tunnel days. That's why. <laughs> they put in the fast lane out there. <laughs> Somebody says, well, the will of God is that we ought to be holy. That holiness, I mean, without sin. Boy, good luck with that. The closer I get to God, the lower I feel. I like Isaiah in chapter 6 when he saw the Lord, finally got the vision of the Lord and saw the Lord. In verse 6 he says, woe is me, I'm undone. The closer you get to God, the more you see how far you've got to go. So being holy isn't something that we're going to master this, this side of heaven and really feel like we've achieved, right? <laughs> But did you know that you can be just as forgiving as Jesus? You can't be as holy as Jesus. You can't be as loving as Jesus. It's just not within our power. But you can be as forgiving. You say, how, how do you say that, preacher? If you forgive everything and everybody, have you matched him? <laughs> you can do that. You can accomplish that. That's doable. Isn't that great to know that the number one thing Jesus wants out of you, you can do? And it doesn't even take work. It doesn't mean you're going to accomplish it because it takes humility. You see, when Jesus gives you salvation, it's free. I find it so easy to witness to people and tell them about Jesus. You know why? It's free. <laughs> and I've got so much of it, I can give Jesus away all day long and not run out of him. <laughs> it's not costing me anything. I can give him away. But when you become forgiving, It's 
Now it's harder to talk to people about being forgiving because it's not very easy. It's going to cost you. I was, I think the best word is compelled to write this book on forgiveness. The title of it is Forgive Instantly and Live Free. And I was compelled by the church folks. I taught this down at the rescue missions. I started working years ago on Skid Row in Chicago, later on to Albuquerque's rescue mission, Atlanta Union Mission. And I taught forgiveness, because forgiveness cures almost every addiction you know. I don't know of an addiction it won't cure, because you need to understand what addictions are. <laughs> addictions are just attempts to be happy. Human effort, how do, I, how do I get all this hurt gone so that I can be happy? And some people turn to drinking, and you name it. There are hundreds of them. Perfectionists, I, I, can, get, I can get your shoes on pretty tight this morning. <laughs> we don't have any perfectionists. One day I was sitting in, uh, in the church I attend. I, I, I never have claimed to have a calling to be a pastor myself. I'm an evangelist and, and willingly love it. And I was sitting there listening to my pastor. I was in about six row back. I tried to stay off first row. I don't want to stare at him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was one of these critters because he said, you know, a perfectionist is just a person who tries to set the bar so high that others can't meet it and it makes him feel better about himself then. Ooh. Sorry if you're a perfectionist here this morning. <laughs> we probably all have a little bit of that in us, don't we? The thing that I had worn on my chest as a badge thinking that I was so smart, so good, <laughs> all of a sudden became a millstone around my neck <laughs> when I realized that it was just another addiction. Just another attempt of human effort to be happy. And it sent me on a pursuit. I walked out of church that day saying, I've got some work to do. I've got some pursuing to do. And that started me on a long journey to learn to forgive. Because forgiveness cures all of those. Now, look at the Lord's Prayer. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You need to understand what bitterness is and what it is in the Lord's prayer here of what he's saying as he forgives so we should forgive. Notice that he equates forgiveness to a debt. It's a debt. Have you ever said, quiz time, have you ever said, you owe me an apology? You just created a debt when you said that. They owe you. Mark it down in your heart. I'm not going to speak to that person until they apologize. There's a ledger marked in the heart. We call that stuff baggage. <laughs> You've heard that term. You're smarter. This church is so smart. Why am I here? <laughs> I need to go where find some dumb people who need to hear this message. <laughs> it creates a debt. And sometimes those debts start when we're children, and you can all think of a child who was abused, sexually abused, or beaten, or whatever. Wow. I was raised by a perfectionist. <laughs> it was easy to become one. And those debts start young in our life and accumulate. And we don't even know they're there. Nobody here this morning ever loses their cool, right? Ever gets ma mad or angry? Nobody? Okay, Pastor, we can go home. They're all just fine. <laughs> myself that 
I had that. The opening story in my book begins on the streets of Chicago. In a road rage here. Where I snapped. And I intentionally plowed my car into another one. That's called road rage. It's what you've all felt like you did, wanted to do, but didn't have the uh, old junk car like I was driving, so I could. <laughs> <laughs> we need to understand how Jesus forgives us when Jesus gives you a pardon that's freedom right that's as though the crime was never committed a pardon sets you free and that's what we get from Jesus when he died on the cross for us he provided a pardon for all those who have simply asked for it but he does something else at the same time. That's not all of what he does. There's two parts to this uh, forgiveness issue that he does. Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. How about Romans 8, 1? There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? There is now therefore no condemnation. There's no charges against you. Jesus gives you a pardon, and at the same time, he erases the slate of the charges against you. Two things he does. He gives you a pardon, and he wipes your slate clean. Someday when I get to heaven, there'll be just sheepish little cowboy showing up in his cowboy boots. I thought I'd dress up fancy for you today. <laughs> if you visit my website, highplains.org, you'll see my wife and I in cowboy hats and whatever. So it's hard to take a boy off of the farm, isn't it? <laughs> um, Tell me where I was before I got lost. <laughs> um, give me a second. I'll be back. Yeah. Forgives our past sins. Someday when I show up in heaven, I'm right back on. Thanks. Stay right there in the second row for me. <laughs> hey, at my age, you need all the... <laughs> and I never have been able to preach with notes, so <laughs> you got to know your material. Someday when I show up in heaven, this sheepish little guy coming in with cowboy boots and this great big judges stand there, awesome, and somebody goes, it's my turn? Okay. And I'm coming in. I got in my hand, though, my pardon that I got from Jesus. It's the only thing I need. I know I'm okay, but I'm still just a little bit wimpish. <laughs> that's a mighty big judge, and that's a mighty big courtroom, and that's a mighty big judge's bench that he's behind. And this big deep voice calls my name, step forward, and I walk forward. And I'm expecting him to read this very long list, probably written on rolls of toilet paper, so it just... Because <laughs> the list is so long. John R. Rice, my beloved friend, used to, used to uh, get on his knees in his hotel room at night and write his sins down so he wouldn't forget to confess any. And then he said, I, when I was done, though, I tore it up and flushed it down the toilet because I didn't want my enemies to see that list. <laughs> the judge calls me over, and I'm perplexed. I got my pardon. I'm ready to go. My only, my only plea is Jesus died for me. And the judge is looking around. What? And he looks down over on this side. He looks He says, I find no charges against this man. I find no charges against this man. I put my pardon back in my pocket. Later on, I'm going to wear it around my neck. Because there are no charges. We've been forgiven. 
and the record's been wiped out. All right. You like it, don't you? But you've heard it before. You're obviously smarter than I am. Do you do that for others? That's the way Jesus forgives us. If you're going to forgive like God does, then you're going to have to give a pardon and you're going to have to wipe away the slate. I had some major things to dig out of my life and my baggage that I was carrying from my childhood. And I had to forgive some things in the past that were creating in me that, that anger that was coming out that would pop off. None of you have ever experienced that, I'm sure. <laughs> and even though some of the folks I had to forgive were dead, forgiveness has nothing to do with the other people. In fact, if they're alive, you don't want them there. <laughs> this isn't about them. This isn't reconciliation. You want to reconcile, you need them there. You want to forgive, that's all about you. That's right. just you. And you get an empty chair, put it in the middle of a room, set down the person that you've had hard feelings against, and you say, I forgive you. Now, you best say that out loud. There are two reasons to say it out loud. Romans 10, 10, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God wants to hear you. And there's one other person in that room that needs to hear you. You. <laughs> you need to hear yourself say that. I forgive you. I cancel the debt. Don't just say I forgive you. Those are empty words. If you don't do the rest of it that says I cancel the debt you owe me, you don't owe me an apology anymore. I'm not going to try to collect an apology from you. I'm not going to try to collect that debt, that money. You ever try and ch collect a childhood back? <laughs> it's tough. You've got to cancel it. That's, is that clock right back there on the wall, Pastor? Okay, keep an eye on me. I may go wild, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to give you something, folks, this morning that I believe will revolutionize your life. It did mine. When I discovered and dug to the dot bottom of forgiveness and made that decision that I would become a forgiving person, my life turned upside down. There are only two days in my life that really count. I'm sorry, it wasn't the day we started the church here. I'm glad we did. It wasn't one of the days that I count the most important to me. The first one was the day Jesus forgave me. Boy, did that change my life. I was 21. Changed the direction of my life. Changed a lot of external things. I, I can remember throwing out my pack of cigarettes on the way down to the University of Missouri. That's when cars had those little side windows. <laughs> Don't you love the history? <laughs> and, and, and I quit smoking. And I remember cleaning up my vocabulary. You should have heard my vocabulary coming off the cattle ranch I was raised on. And it, and it changed a lot in my life. The second day that I count important in my life is the day I learned to forgive others. That changed my heart. That changed my heart. It was a miracle. I don't think humans can do that. I had tried for years to manage that little pop-off temper I had. Aren't you glad I didn't stay as your pastor? And <laughs> I'd have banged one of your cars somewhere here, right here. In the <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God takes us along and we learn for the perfecting of the saints because that's what he's doing. He's trying to perfect you. And I actually discovered something. I discovered 
the entrance, the secret door to the abundant life. Turn with me just one page, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. If I had to retitle, <laughs> I'm glad God didn't ask me to, but if I had to retitle, <laughs> by the way, if I had the opportunity to give a title to the Bible, I, you know the Bible is, is short for bibliography, that's what that stands for, holy, a holy collection of books, a holy bibliography is what the Holy Bible, why we call it the Holy Bible. You know what a bibliography is? A collection of books, 66 books. If I actually gave it a title, I'd title it the Book of Forgiveness. That's just me. Because that's what I think it's about from start to finish. And if I had to title Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I'd title it Lessons in Forgiveness. Because after you get on this topic and you begin to read these verses with forgiveness in mind and the depth of it, you'll see it coming out everywhere. That he's talking about the only thing he expects out of you. He expects you to be forgiving. Wow. Isn't that right? If you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. Does he expect it? He demands it? Commands it? You may not like that verse. I've had people argue with me on that verse. I say, take it up with Jesus. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. It's not my verse. Some of them will say, well, that verse, Jesus said that in the Old Testament. The church didn't start until Pentecost, 50 days after the ascension. So that's an Old Testament verse. doesn't apply to us. I'd rather spend my time trying to meet that verse rather than argue about it, wouldn't you? It's, it's safer. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Don't argue with God. <laughs> I've done that a few times. I've always lost. <laughs> Haven't you? <laughs> Just do it. This verse is so important. Folks, I'm trying to tell you, you only need to do one thing in your Christian life, and God will be happy with you. I had 13 editors on this book. Go over this book. Read this. Give me feedback. They insisted I write it. They heard. They would catch little little truths that I gave in the church in various places and in, in places I taught and they would say you you got to put that in writing so that we can get that you can't just give that to the inner city missions you got to make that available to us out here in the churches and they insisted that I write this book so I okay I'll write it but you guys got to help me edit it and one of the guys said this book is so fantastic I've read so many books and they give us five things to do do these seven things he says, your book says, just do one. Just become forgiving. But do it really well. <laughs> do it right. It's the only thing God demands of you. The rest of it, if you fail at something, guess what? He'll forgive you. <laughs> but this one, he won't forgive. Let's get this one down then, don't you think? Let's just, if, if you got to do just one thing, let's do this one. Because the rest of them, he'll forgive you if you miss. I didn't give you the fifth word. One of the editors of the book, uh, when we launched the book, I had all the editors come. These are men that I have worked with, and ladies. Um, and I had them at the book launch to speak. And one of the guys got up and he said, he pulled out of his billful, and pulled a card, a little business card sized card out of it. And on it were five words. He said, Terry gave me this card four years ago. It's still in my pocket. And I still live by it. And on it were these four words, five words. Forgive everybody for everything instantly. 
<laughs> I did tell you the title of the book was Forgive Instantly, didn't I? I, I was saving the hard part for last. Instant forgiveness. I, you know the Pharisees are still alive in America. <laughs> they, they want to argue. Instant forgiveness. No, forgiveness is conditional. All right, I'll think about that for a while. Forgiveness is conditional. In other words, they're saying, if they apologize to me, I'll forgive them. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness isn't conditional. If it's, if it's forgiveness is conditional, there, there could be only one to twist in there. And that would be what Jesus said, I've forgiven you, therefore the condition is met. You have to forgive. That'd be the only condition, right? Because you've been forgiven, you have to forgive. Wow. If there's a condition, that could be the only one. And certainly, you can't require a condition of others. So instant forgiveness became this challenge. As I was working on this, and I was teaching at the mission, and I had all of these alcoholics I was working with, and homeless people, it, it, just, it just grew. And it began to change lives. So when they got forgiveness down correctly and understood that empty chair routine, boy, that's so important. Get in a room by yourself all by yourself. That leaves you and God there, right? And you can forgive. Cancel the debt. That frees a person. And when I got men to do that, it freed them. Now that takes care of the baggage and the history behind. Everything that's come to this point that is added up and accumulated in the heart. And by the way, that's in Mark chapter 7, verse 15. He says, it's not the things that come at you that destroy your life, that make you miserable, that keep you living in the desert, in the wilderness. It's not your circumstances. It's not the neighbor. It's, it's not your wife elbowing you on a Sunday morning. He says, what's destroying you is what comes out of your own heart. That's the baggage we carry. If we haven't let things go from the past, we're carrying it. Now, you may have put it out of your mind. It may not be there. But it's in the heart. And it will come out. I tried for years to manage it. My wife would drop a glass on the floor. And I would say, what'd you do that for? I know, I see your faces. It's a bad comment. It's, it's who I was on the inside. I was this negative, critical person because of what I had on the inside. I was carrying some baggage, and it made me critical. It made me a perfectionist. Fortunately, I've never been an addict, never tried drugs in my life. Thank God I can help those people who have. But I had my own type of addictions. You got any? <laughs> Anger, perfectionist, whatever. We have so many. I, I hate to name them. The list is really long. Anything we do as humans to produce fake happiness is an addiction. And there are a lot of those. We get hooked on driving fancy cars. We get hooked on money. Anything that produces fake happiness is an addiction. That's the past, getting rid of the baggage of the past. Now, the tough part is I developed those four words, and I had those down. I didn't have to manage my life anymore. Now when my wife drops a glass after I became a forgiving person, by the way, for me, that happened in one hour when it finally dug into the scriptures to the point I understood that I had to forgive. I sat down in a chair. People I had to forgive, and I did it. My life turned upside down. I felt the peace of God that passes. For the first time in my life, I had done one thing God had asked me to do and do it right. I had become forgiven. I knew I had finally accomplished one thing God had asked me to do. I forget. What a peace of God came over me. But now, stuff still comes at you. It's not going to stop. The world's not going to quit. Right? You're still going to have to uh, be in the world. 
We're not of the world, but we're in it. Some guy, before you leave here today and get home, somebody's going to cut you off in traffic. Doesn't happen in Iowa? Not enough traffic? <laughs> How do you do that instantly now? How do you face the current things going? How do you keep from baggage coming in? How do you keep those hard feelings of, you owe me an apology? You can't do that to me. You can't cut me off in traffic. We get offended five times a day. Are you lucky to be down to that number? <laughs> How, how do you handle the instant? Man, I began to work on that. I had this down so that when my wife drops a glass now, it's, can I get a broom? Did you get hurt? The other day, uh, a blueberry fell on the floor, and somebody had stepped on it, and there were these tracks going across. <laughs> In my old days of perfectionism, I would have said, What'd you do that for? <laughs> but now I notice it. She didn't notice it. I noticed it. And I'm down on the floor with a rag, scrubbing them up. And, and she said, what are you doing? I said, well, somebody dropped a blueberry. I'm picking it up. And she says, well, who stepped on it? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I'll bet you'll find a mark on, the, on a shoe or a sock of whoever did it. <laughs> Well, we couldn't find a marker, but she had forgotten that she had changed socks. <laughs> and it was on her sock. <laughs> but guess what? I'm the guy that eats the blueberries, so I'm the guy that spilled it, you know? We're in it together. There's, there's nothing inside of me to come out. I don't have to manage anger because I don't have any. That doesn't mean I can't get mad, but I have to make a decision to get mad. There's no leftover baggage in me. You, you, get the, you get the deal? Now, how do, you keep a, how do you do this instant? How do I forgive somebody when they cut you off in traffic and you're just about ready to go like that? You've never done that. The instant part became really tough because I had this down. The past was gone and the anger was gone and I was living at peace. But stuff still came at me. Blueberries or whatever. My wife still drops glasses. She's still the same person. <laughs> but none of those things bother me now. But as things came, you know, something, oh, and I'd begin to think about it. And then I'd spend 15, 20 minutes vegetating on it. Is that a good word? Milling it over in my mind. Are you sure I need to forgive this? Is this in everything? Is this in everybody? <laughs> Can I keep this one? <laughs> this one's pretty serious. Hmm. I had to figure out a way to do instant forgiveness because Jesus did. I saw him on the cross forgive those who had not yet finished crucifying him. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. If he can do it, I can do it. If he can forgive instantly, there ought to be a way for me to do it. I kept digging. The answer came in ownership. When I figured out, really, the Garden of Eden story and who the owner was, I've got a, uh, out, out the windows a 10-year-old F-150 Brown pickup up there. Mm -hmm. And if you, cowboy boots on, <laughs> and you go kick in the door of my pickup, you would owe me for the damage because I own that pickup, right? you would need to come back in and give me a check for $300 or whatever it is to fix that dent because I'm the owner. You wouldn't give a check to my truck, would you? You'd give a check to the owner of the truck. And when you make God your owner, people don't need to give you an apology or pay you or owe you. They owe your owner. And you can dodge every offense that comes at you. 
when somebody cuts me off in traffic now, I tell you, this does wonders for your prayer life. <laughs> your, whole prayer, your whole life changes when you get forgiveness right. I want to tell you, this is a miracle, folks. If you haven't come to the place of deeply understanding and doing forgiveness, you're probably still walking in the wilderness and haven't hit the promised land yet. When somebody cuts me off in traffic, it's so easy now, I instantly pray for them. Do you know that this dummy has just offended the greatest power in the universe? He has harmed one of his possessions. He's dented this F-150 that belongs to God. <laughs> And he owes God. And God is capable of wrecking his entire day. <laughs> if not killing him. And instantly, I can pray, give him a little mercy, God, I'm okay, it wasn't that bad. Don't exact any more than you really need to. You find yourself praying for your enemies with a smile. Remember that verse, pray for your enemies? How many of you do that? You just love doing that. You will. When you get the ownership issue right, when you mark God down as your owner, you'll find it fun to pray for your enemies. You really will. It changes your life, is it? Are you okay? You doing all right? Anybody sleeping want to go home? I know I'm a boring speaker, but <laughs> your pastor will be back next week. Praise God. <laughs> Get this, this is so important, folks. Ownership. We have taught in our churches dedication to God. Be more dedicated. Be more, uh, uh, boy, use all the words you want to. For, get more spiritual and climb the ladder. Folks, this is giving up on all that and going to the other direction. I'm just a Ford F-150. God owns me. It, it takes away all, all of the pride. It takes away everything out of you. One of the, I started, after I mastered and wrote this book on forgiveness, I started working on pride. I said, well, let's do that one. That's another biggie. <laughs> Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 9, you, you have not arrived, you haven't accomplished, you haven't grown, he says. You haven't really mastered it. It's because you have, if you haven't mastered it, it's because you have forgotten that you've been forgiven. You know why I titled this whole book, the book about forgiveness? Because that's the only thing God demands of us, is forgiveness. And he wrote this whole book about it. And when you get that focus and you start rereading this Bible with you being forgiving as Jesus involved, this whole book lights up like a, like a neon light. I understand the scripture so much better now. Things I missed before, they stand out. And I said, wow, how did I miss that? I used my old, same old excuse just now, I will fumble. <laughs> you see, Adam was owned by God. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Because if you get ownership correct, you will be restoring your relationship that you have with God. And isn't that what you want, a relationship with God? A daily walk with Him. We don't want a relationship in the wilderness. We want to be in the promised land. We want to be where He wants us. And that's with him as owner. You see, the issue in the Garden of Eden was not a tree. And it was not a fruit. We don't know what it was. Apple? We all say the apple. Could have been an orange. It doesn't say. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. It was, God can afford 10 cent apples all day long. He can steal his apple. I don't know. 
It was about the entire garden. The whole issue was who's going to be the owner of the garden? Who's going to make the rules? That was the issue. It was ownership of the garden. You see, relationships are defined by rules. We have parents here today, right? You have a rule in your house, don't you? Somewhere you've got one. If you don't, I know your children will have rules for you. Because having a rule establishes that you are the rule maker and they are the rule followers. And that's what God, God just needed one rule because that established him. I'm God, you're not. I'm the rule maker, you don't. And when Adam and Eve decided to make the rule, they were taking over God's place. They were firing him and becoming ruler of the garden. They were becoming the God of the garden. They became their own God. They became responsible. Now, if you're making the rules, you're responsible for enforcing them. Now, think of this before the... Before the fall, are you still okay? Oh, my word. Time is getting away. I gotta hurry. <laughs> Before the fall, God noticed, God owned Adam. God noticed that Adam had a problem. What was Adam's problem before the fall? He was lonely. Yeah, God noticed that. He was lonely. That was before the fall. There was a flaw in him. He was lonely. Did Adam discover that and come to God and say, hey, God, I got a problem. I want you to handle this. Adam is dumb. He doesn't know he's lonely. He'd never been unlonely. <laughs> so how could he know he was lonely? He did. What? Well, God being the owner is responsible for Adam. He made him. He's responsible. He know. I notice when my truck needs an oil change. My truck doesn't tell me, right? I'm the owner. I'm responsible for it. I care for it. I'm on the hook for fixing it or whatever. God was on the hook for everything about Adam because he owned Adam. And therefore, Adam, or God brought all the animals past him to name. See if you can find something that'll fix this. And because he owned Adam, he didn't ask Adam for a rib. He put Adam to sleep. He took a rib. Why? Because he owned Adam. He'd do with what Adam what he wanted. And he brought Eve. Thank God that was a good deal. Because Adam didn't have anything to say about that either. <laughs> God owned them. But they took themselves out of God's ownership at the garden. And that's why we commit the same sin as Adam and Eve every time we say, you owe me an apology. We are taking ownership of ourselves. We're saying, you don't owe God, you owe me an apology. We're doing what Adam and Eve, we do that. Wow, isn't that awesome? We commit the same sin as Adam and Eve just by owning ourselves. I've changed the way I witness the people a lot. I used to do a lot on the Ten Commandments and burn that topic of sin on. It's really easy now to talk to people about doing what Adam and Eve did. I kind of admit that, yeah, I run my own life. <laughs> That's a, they're, they're their own God. And we as Christians live in the wilderness because we insist on still running our own life. As an illustration, some, you've heard it said, um, um, God is my co-pilot. Have you heard that phrase? And then, okay, let's be spiritual. We don't, you know, that's really nice. God is my co-pilot. He's in here with me. But if you really want to be spiritual, you put God over in the pilot seat and, and let him pilot the thing, right? He's not just riding with you. He's running it. You like, you like that? Okay, let me, let me give you this then. Let me kick the chair out from underneath you. I'm telling you, you're riding in the wrong plane. 
You're riding in your plane and you want God to pilot your plane. <laughs> get out of your plane <laughs> and get in God's plane. You're still asking, if he's piloting your plane, you can take him out and he's like, okay, I'll take over. <laughs> Taking God to the ownership level changes your life, people. It will take you out of the wilderness and put you in the promised land. Remember that little verse in, in uh, um, did we read it? Mark? Mark 7? Oh, we didn't. Uh, 13. Enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there are who go that way. Because narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Now, did your, word, did your Bible have the word narrow or broad or uh, straight? I have a King James Bible. But it has two different words there. Never understood that. I can't keep up with them. I want to point out one word in this text. It's the word find. Way down at the bottom. This is broad as a way of destructive living. How many of the children of Israel died in the wilderness? Broad was a way of destructive living. But narrow is the path that God wants you to take. And few there be that find it. Find it. I'm telling you, if you want to find the abundant life that he promises, look under the rock. It's marked forgive. It's under there. Right? That's where you'll find it. And how come so few find it? Because if you forgive, it will cost you. This guy who owes you so much, you've got to cancel that. Somebody cheated you out of $50,000? You've got to cancel it. What could cost you $50,000? Somebody cheated you out of your childhood? Cancel that death. You give up your childhood. Somebody's offended you, and they owe you. It'll cost you. Give up that death. See how much it's going to cost you? Whosoever findeth his life shall lose it. Whosoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. You let God be owner, you're giving up everything. But on the other side is the abundant life. The life of peace. It's a life that when your wife steps on a blueberry, you clean it up. And you live at peace. Whew. Have we covered a lot? Are you still awake? Have I lost you? You're okay with me coming back? Amen. Okay. I wanted to give you my best. It's the only thing I felt I could write about was the topic of forgiveness. Because I think it's the only thing worth writing about. Because it's number one on Jesus' list. And he wants it to be number one on yours. I wrote a whole book on it. And I've just been able to give you a 30-minute glaze on it. And I have copies with me. They sell for $1,550 each. <laughs> I've got about 26 copies here that I'll let go for 10 bucks. <laughs> now, if you do want a copy, I, the details of this, I, I can't give you all. And not all of you get a book, we'll really dig it to the depth. If you will pursue forgiveness and his ownership of you, you have a fantastic church, but I guarantee it will turn your church upside down. It will impact this community like nothing else you've ever seen. When you become totally forgiving, just like Jesus, you're a different person. You smile when others are growling. You're happy when the rest are frowning. 
when you understand things that the world passes by and can't comprehend. So afterwards, um, Pastor, I'm going to give the service back to you. I'll just have these books up on the stage here if they want them. And, and I apologize. I wish I could give them to you. Uh, I'm reprinting them so we can give away a lot of copies uh, uh, to inner city missions. But um, Okay, I'm done. Thanks, Pastor.